are very, very uh, glad and honored uh, to have Dr. Drought with us here this morning, uh, and I look forward to hear him speak more about philology this morning. So, Michael, thank you. It's great. It's great to be here, and. Um, I think the big debate is whether it's uh, hex paper or regular graph paper for your map to find yourself back to your room. Uh, <laughs> we'll have to test and see which one works better. <clears throat> so um, my wife was not entirely thrilled about my speaking here today, uh, not because she has anything against myth mood, but because this weekend my daughter has a dance recital, my son has a pile of baseball games, and you know I am needed because I can drive people places. So, so I said to her, I said, well, this is a big and important audience, and some of the leading fantasy scholars are there, and the people in the audience actually really know the material, so it's really valuable that way. And um, and I'll get back in time for the recital on Sunday, it's no problem. So she says, okay, now what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, that, that is the best part. <laughs> they asked me to give a talk on Germanic philology. <laughs> and there's a long pause, and she said, I thought you said it was a big audience. <laughs> So, um, it is a big audience, so there. <laughs> the, 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 and that right there actually is part of the problem, um, is that Germanic philology can be a punchline. And uh, it wasn't always the case. Uh, for example, in 1848, the uh, Frankfurt National Versammlung, the uh, Frankfurt National Assembly, which was the first freely elected parliament in Germany, met for the first time. And this assembly was, was very carefully planned even down to the seating uh, details. I mean, it was a meeting of Germans, um, what you expect. We Germans have many excellent cultural characteristics, but spontaneity is usually not you know, listed in the top of them. So of course, all the seating was planned out perfectly, and we actually have a seating chart of the uh, Frankfurter National Versammlung, as I like saying that. Um, and it's about what you'd expect. You know, there's major factions, there's a left and there's a right, and there's an aisle down the center, and there's the speakers and everything. But the, the really interesting point, which was noted by uh, Jop Leersen in his book National Thought in Europe, is that directly in the middle of the aisle, in front of the speaker, the aisle that separated the left from the right, was a single seat. And in the seating plan, there's a label next to it, and it says, J. Grimm. And yes, that's Jacob Grimm. Um, most people, you know, know him from him and his brother's fairy tale collection. But his contributions include uh, founding the discipline of linguistics by discovering the sound shift that is now known as Grimm's Law, uh, being responsible for the monumental German dictionary uh, Deutsches Wörterbuch, uh, and the first scientific German grammar uh, Deutsche Grammatik, and uh, also for Deutsche Mythologia, which laid the foundations for folklore studies and comparative mythology. So that's all that he was up to. <laughs> And uh, in the eyes of educated Germans in the 19th century, Grimm was the authority on German law and custom. If Grimm said something was German or that it was not Deutsch, uh, the argument was basically over. So in 1848, the philologists were so important that they were given the front and center seat in the assembly that wrote the Constitution of Germany. It's kind of been downhill for us ever since. <laughs> And I want to add, too, that the respect that was given to philology was not merely caused by 19th century Germans have some, having some outsized respect for scholars in general. Uh, although th there were a surprising number of academics in the National Assembly, there were 49, uh, which was more than 10%. Um, a, uh, this was not universally applauded by the people who talked about the Frankfurt National Versammlung. Uh, there's a satirical verse from the time that mocks this uh, assembly, and it was, Dreimal hundred Advocaten, Vaterland, du bist verraten. Dreimal hundred Professoren, Vaterland, du bist verloren. Which means three times a hundred lawyers, Fatherland, you are betrayed. Three times a hundred professors, Fatherland, you are doomed. So, can't say that they're wrong. Um, so it wasn't academia in general that commanded such outside respect, uh, outside respect. It was the specific discipline of philology and, and the specific person of Grimm. And uh, so we might ask, why did philology have such power and prestige at that moment? And the answer is success and, and power, success and power. First, uh, the discipline that Grimm and Rasmus Rask, Franz Bopp, 
uh, if I ever am crazy enough to found a second journal, which I'm not, I'm going to call it BOP, but it will stand for Boring Old Philological Papers. Um, <laughs> Uh, Carl Ferner and others had built this, this discipline. Uh, it, it had systematically explained a huge number of phenomena that had previously only been understood in a fragmented, ad hoc manner. And suddenly it was possible to see how languages evolve from each other, to match up linguistic changes with historical and cultural knowledge. Uh, and this abstract success spawned my myriads of other practical successes. You could read texts that had been obscured, you could learn languages that were no longer spoken, you could recognize deep identities under surface variation. Uh, for example, Colloquialicus in uh, Gregory of Tours, and Hügleicher in Inglinga Saga, and Hijelak in Beowulf, same guy. You could trace the linguistics and the linguistic and cultural borrowings with a kind of detail and complexity that revealed lost history and explained the thoughts of long dead people. You recovered from single words, this is the joy of philology, you, you recover whole histories. And I'm just going to take uh, one name, for example, and that's uh, the name Theodoric, which is the sort of the quintessential medieval name, so much so that when Steve Martin decided to uh, make fun of medieval medicine, he, he named his character Theodoric of York, medieval barber. And uh, if you haven't seen that sketch, it's on YouTube and it's worth, uh, it's worth watching. So there's Theodoric, ultimately medieval. Uh, that name comes from Germanic, actually. Theodo, Greeks. The Theod is the same root as in Theoden. Uh, it means king or leader of a people, and, uh, or a people. And then Greeks, uh, Reich, the same thing, a region. So it's uh, Theodoric means people ruler. Uh, it's a good name for a king. Like, all the kings of Rohan are named things like that, like people ruler or leader of people or director of Rohan or whatever. Um, <laughs> except for Deor, and that drives me insane. Um, but, uh, the, so there's Theodorix. Now, this name gets mistakenly Latinized by Gregory of Tours, also the one who gives us the, the Colloquialicus, uh, as Theodorus, uh, because he thought it was a cognate of a Greek name that meant God gift. So it takes the name Theodoric and says, uh, puts it together. And actually, that's kind of this, I, I, some people think it's a mistake, and I wonder if it's just on purpose, uh, in the same way that um, the names, uh, the Anglo-Saxons like the name Michael or Mitchell, because it is a bilingual pun. It's he who is like God in Hebrew and big and strong in Anglo-Saxon. And it's the same thing, by the way, if you know uh, Japanese-American girls and a surprising number, at least when I was growing up, were named Naomi. And that's because that's a it's a it's a name from the Bible and sort of means like beautiful girl in uh, Japanese. So people like names like that that can work in both their their traditions. Um, in any event, this name Theodoric first spread throughout Northern Europe uh, through the Germanic migrations. Uh, it was the name is Theothrakar in Old Norse, and then uh, it becomes from really well spread from the legends of the great hero of Dietrich von Bern, uh, who really was. Theodoric of Verona. Uh, he led the Ostrogoths into Italy. Uh, in High German, then the name is Dietrich, uh, which is shortened to Dirk. So there we get Dirk's Bentley and Dirk Benedict and everything is actually Theodor, Theodoric. And um, also Dieter. And this is the time on Sprockets in the dance. It's from that. <laughs> See, I'm so old that only like 20% of it. <laughs> um, the French version of the name is Thierry. And the English reflexes of the name Derek and Terry are actually re-importations into England from the Netherlands for Derek and from French for uh, Terry. Uh, there's also a surviving name in Romance languages. If you know anyone whose last name is uh, Teodorico, a uh, pretty popular Italian name in the north of Italy, that's uh, also. And then finally, there's a Welsh form of the name as it gets adapted into Celtic, which is Tudor, which is the root for the Tudor dynasty. And so in that one name, trace that one name, Theodoric, around, that's the power of uh, philology. Uh, we kind of take it for granted, uh, if we think of it at all, but this absolutely thrilled the educated minds of Europe when it was first demonstrated in the 19th century. Uh, the, philosoph the philological method had success after success, uh, and many of these were only famous within academic specializations. Uh, for example, when Edward Sievers figured out that the source of Genesis B was a Old Saxon text for this one pat section, and then 19 years later someone discovered the Old Saxon manuscript in the Vatican Library, uh, proving him right. 
Um, when uh, NFS Grundtvig, the, who's mentioned by Tolkien a, a few times, uh, figured out that the Clogiliacus in Gregory of Tours is the Hijalac in Beowulf. Uh, and so what happened with this is the general idea spread that there was scientific methods that could see through time in a way that the telescope and the microscope allowed us to see through space. Apply your philological method and you can see what was happening in time. And that's where the power came from. Uh, there's been arguments, I, I find them a little bit frustrating, that was, was philologi philology a cause or a result of rising European nationalism? I'm pretty sure a result is the answer. Um, uh, but it is obvious that the, the potential of the discipline to provide politically valuable information had been recognized by the middle of the 19th century, if not sooner. Uh, philological study could, in principle, tell you who was a German and who was not, and therefore which parts of Europe historically belonged to Germany, France, Denmark, Russia, etc. Uh, who was a German is the defining question for about 150 years of European history. Uh, it, and it's, so it's in hindsight, maybe it's easy to mock this confidence in philology, or even to attack it by seeing it as a contributing factor um, to the bloody wars that were fought to settle the mess created by Louis the Pious, idiotically dividing his kingdom among his three sons. But a, uh, a closer reading of the historical record shows, I think, that the philologists themselves and the political leaders who use their works were trying to find some way of sorting out competing truth claims that were otherwise irresolvable. Uh, of course, each side only used the evidence that it supported uh, its point, but the belief that you could resolve such enormous disputes about borders and nationality and power, uh, that you could resolve them potentially through evidence, argument, and logic, uh, kind of shows that the ideals of reason occupied a much higher plane then than they do now. That, you know, I look at it this way, and Tom, Tom Shippey originally came up with this, this idea also. Uh, we might think that it's stupid or irrational to determine the borders of a country by trying to identify exactly which illiterate tribe lived there in the year 422, but it's not entirely obvious that machine guns, trench warfare, poison gas, and genocide are a better way of handling it. Um, you know, maybe uh, snippy articles in philological journals are even better than, say, angry Twitter mobs at, at uh, settling problems. So there was this century kind of between Grimm and Hitler where philology ruled the intellectual roost in much the same way that the discipline of physics dominated the post-World War II era. Outside the academy, it offered the potential for power, and so it brought in financial support. Uh, inside the academy, it worked intellectually. And then Hitler ruined everything. Yeah, that's a controversial statement. One of my <laughs> colleagues in, um, in journal, when I was in journalism school, and one of my colleagues uh, said one time, I wrote some, you know, we were doing opinion writing, and he's like, oh, that's taking a big risk, Mike, saying something bad about Hitler. Boy, <laughs> you can almost tell when someone's got, like, nothing else to say. Like, <laughs> that's a, no one's going to argue with me there. Um, so the reality is a little more complicated, but it's not wrong, uh, what I said. Uh, in the aftermath of even World War I, Many scholars in English departments had become suspicious and critical of philology. Uh, a lot of this was usual academic scramble for spots in the pecking order. So if you're not good at philology, then you say philology isn't that good, and the thing that you're good at is. Uh, but then there's also opportunistic guilt by association, because many of the greatest philologists were German, and you just fought a bloody war against Germany. So some scholars in both England and America sort of claim that philology itself, dominated by these great Germans, um, had led to German arrogance, and thus to the war. And you thought my Hitler ruined everything was reductive. Um, as Tolkien wrote in the 1920s, in the year's work in philological studies, in some quarters, philology was spoken of as if it were something that the late war was fought to end. Uh, nevertheless, mo most academics were not stupid enough to completely eliminate a discipline that worked, just because of the nationality of its found leading scholars. Philology continued to have triumphs in the 20s and 30s, many of them, well, several very large ones by Tolkien, um, until Hitler really did ruin everything, or at least everything that could be stereotyped as Germanic. Now, contrary to what uh, one person who shall remain nameless but is, was identified as a thought leader, whatever that means, um, but obviously hasn't read a lot of mythology, uh, Germanic myths and Germanic languages are not any more inherently genocidal than any set of myths from any other culture. 
Uh, no, by the way, I'm not claiming that Germanic myth doesn't include plenty of bloodshed, murder, and the idea that people outside one's immediate tribe are subhuman barbarians. Uh, it's just that pretty much every mythology does that. So the Germans weren't particularly bad. Uh, Germanic mythology just had the bad luck to be embraced by a particular group of evil genocidal nutbags who had inherited the power of a modern state that they could never have built on their own with their own incompetence. Um, and so even though uh, the Nazis actually, in their aesthetics and their rhetoric, put a lot more emphasis on how modern, scientific, and cutting edge they were, uh, their slime rubbed off on everything that they touched, and that included the things that were Germanic. So that would made a big change, because since the 17th century, the idea of Germanic had actually been something that was set in balance and opposition to that which was Roman or classical. And the Germanism was associated with things like individual freedom, uh, the rights of all, the resistance against centralization, and the tyranny of collectivism. And then suddenly in the 1940s, it becomes collective race hatred and totalitarianism. Thanks, Nazi losers. So in the immediate aftermath of World War II, a bunch of opportunistic scholars used the widespread loathing of things Germanic to imply a link between the discipline of philology and Nazism. And yes, that makes absolutely no sense if you think about it logically for two minutes, but we're talking about academics here. Um, <laughs> using the completely earned widespread loathing of anything the Nazis had touched, opponents of philology were able to push the discipline out of the center of the literary curriculum in a remarkably short time, in about six years. So philology had been a requirement for a PhD in anything literary or linguistic everywhere in 1945. And by 1951, Harvard dropped its old English requirement for an English PhD. And it was a domino effect that, that flew out there. It, it was almost instantaneous in, in academic glacial terms, um, how quickly it happened. So perhaps in another decade, uh, we'll be able to figure out how much of this turn against philology was led by scholars who had actually supported National Socialism and Stalinism in the 1930s, right up until the instant that Hitler attacked Russia and then they turned on a dime. And many of these people had wanted to scrub their intellectual pasts uh, after the war. Uh, and I, I'm not going to say who all of them are, <clears throat> Paul DeMond, but um, <laughs> Martin Heidegger, um, but for present purposes, I will just point out that not only was there a lot of side switching and virtue signaling, uh, but also that philology's focus on the past was ideologically unwanted by scholars who sympathized with uh, some of the various international socialist movements, like the Cultural Revolution in China or the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, who believed that by re erasing the past, starting from zero, you could bring about um, social improvement. Uh, that worked out really well for them. Uh, and so there may come a day when, when all of the bastards who put this program in place uh, are dead, that we finally get an accurate history of the culture comp that was waged in university departments from the 1940s through the 1960s. But today is not that day. Uh, so instead of spending more time on the mendacity and the political opportunism of those who attacked philology, can you tell which side I'm on here? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to hide it. Uh, I, I will instead note that the discipline also had some real problems of its own. In many ways, it was a victim of its own success. Uh, many of the great philological projects had been, were complete by the middle of the 20th century, uh, and it may require geniuses like Henry Bradley, C.T. Onions, as he pronounced his name, but it's spelled onions, um, and J.R.R. Tolkien to write a monumental dictionary, but any doofus like me can open up one and read it. Uh, so with the completion of things like the OED and various other dictionaries, grammars, surveys, concordances, and series of editions and manuscript facsimiles, it suddenly became possible for rather ordinary scholars to perform quickly and mechanically uh, the feats which had required years of labor and singular abilities. Literature might still need philology, but it did not need so many philologists. Uh, it's also the case, as Tom Shippey has noted many times, that many professors of philology utterly neglected their teaching because they were secure in their knowledge that they did not have to attract students to their required classes. Such a situation is almost certain to produce terrible teachers and miserable students, and boy, did it ever. And then a final in, uh, internal contributing factor was the problem that still bedevils philology to, to this day, which I'm trying to work on but not getting where I want to, is that a complete lack of effective textbooks, 
or other ways for interested students to learn philology in the absence of a good teacher or in the presence of a bad teacher. Uh, the methods, uh, the insights, and the deep knowledge of the discipline were, and still are, scattered about in footnotes, reference guides, articles with misleading titles, um, dictionaries, grammars, and technical studies. Uh, philology has, since Grimm, been taught by the apprentice method, which is absolutely superior to being taught by textbooks right up until the moment when the teacher-student chain is broken and the whole thing collapses as it pretty much has in the late part of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century. So it wasn't the case that the great tower of philology had rotten foundations and the whole thing tumbled over in the aftermath of World War II. It's actually kind of the opposite. The foundation was solid and strong. It's founded on the bedrock of logic and effective methodology. But a generation who had grown up safe inside the tower never expected to have to maintain the great structure. They lacked the strength and the dedication of their builders, of the builders, and they did not possess the skills or the special knowledge. Uh, so when the roof fell in, they couldn't replace it, and instead they built little thatched huts inside the crumbling walls. And you see what reading Tolkien scholarship does, like <laughs> metaphor alert there. Um, now, to a medievalist uh, or a Tolkienist, this sense of being uh, obviously inferior to one's predecessors is immediately recognizable. Uh, it's obviously recognizable within Middle-earth, uh, but it's also in all the early medieval works from the British Isles, and, and for good reason. The authors were walking around Roman ruins, large stone buildings that in the first few centuries of Anglo-Saxon England were less useful than a thatched barn. I'm not making this up either. In the best book ever written on the subject of broken Roman pottery, and yes, I have read more than one, so there. <laughs> Brian Ward Perkins shows how the breakdown of trade routes in the, at the end of the Roman Empire led to the collapse of roofs in Anglo-Saxon England decades later. Uh, Roman buildings needed tile roofs. The open spans were too long to uh, be thatched effectively. The thatch, got, when it got wet, got heavy and caused any... They didn't have giant beams that could be so long, so the roof fell in. Um, the tiles were shipped from different parts of the empire that either had the right kind of clay or the workers with the knowledge to make roof tiles. Uh, that was no big deal when the trade routes were working. The ship came every year, you went down to the dock, you bought, bought some tiles, you fixed your roof, everything was fine. Then the ship started coming every other year. And then it started coming every five years. And then the roof fell in for lack of maintenance. And once those roofs had fallen in, and this is a really practical thing, you could not live in those buildings even despite their stone, strong stone walls. And so the Anglo-Saxons either just scavenged the stone and built new smaller buildings with it, or they built wood buildings from scratch. Uh, the poem, The Ruin, which is the source for Legolas's uh, Lament of the Stones in uh, The Ring Goes South, uh, describes tiles showering off of a collapsing roof. And the ruins stood in the landscape. They were both a memory and an accusation. Talk about metaphor alert. Uh, the ruins in the Anglo-Saxon landscape were an inescapable reminder that human progress is not relentless and inevitable. It just looks that way right into the day it stops and the roof caves in on you. And then you're wandering the landscape, humbled by the mighty works of your ancestors that you and your culture can no longer accomplish. You can understand why the Anglo-Saxons had such a big inferiority complex. It wasn't a complex. They were inferior. They could not do what the Romans had done. They were so inferior, in fact, that it was not long before the Roman ruins were being called things like Eild Enta Yoerch, the ancient work of giants. Well, it actually says of ents, but they meant giants. Uh, because they didn't know what ents were. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, the, my, I mean, my take is that Tolkien loved this as a kind of double joke that you go to a ruin and someone says, that's the work of the ents. And the people who are not in the know thinks that means that the ants built it, but it's actually a ruin because the ants ruined it in uh, Isengard. And I think that's a, I think El Inta Yawerk is, uh, he's playing with that there. But um, now, the, now I will say that the literate and the educated elite in the monasteries knew better than to attribute the ruins to supernatural causes because they knew some history. They had a good idea of the heights of the culture that had previously been achieved. Uh, and they preserved memories lost to the uneducated masses. But they were also constantly faced with the knowledge that although they might be able to understand and even appreciate the accomplishments of their predecessors, they could not repeat them. And that's pretty much what it's like to be a philologist in my generation. We walk through an intellectual landscape dotted with ruins, 
and perhaps we feel a bit superior because we understand and appreciate them in a way that non-philologists cannot. Uh, we know they're not the work of giants, but of our intellectual ancestors. But we also can never escape from that, from knowing that, like the dwarves of Erebor, with regard to metalwork, we cannot rival the works of our fathers. And that knowledge, and that sense of inferiority, and really not just a sense, but an accurate assessment of one's own abilities, that can really weigh upon you. Well, that's cheery. I'm sure <laughs> Professor, Professor Olson is just thrilled that he invited me to start off the conference with this. Um, you know, let's get off to a real happy start. But, but you guys asked for dramatic philology, and dramatic philology you shall get. <laughs> And one of the most important features of dramatic philology is that when it's done properly, it tells you the actual truth, not what you want the truth to be, which is actually why it's not popular in English departments right now. Um, and the truth is that not only is my generation of philologists much smaller than previous generations, but we're not as good either. The first part of that statement I just made is not controversial because it's measurable. There's many fewer philologists now than there were in Tolkien's day. And some of those reasons for the decline are exactly what I just talked about, right? Ideology, competition for resources, anti-Germanism, academic politics, academic dishonesty, but I'm sorry to repeat myself. Um, the, the exiling of philologists from English departments is undeniable. Uh, only one generation ago, when I first got my PhD, uh, every respectable English department had to have at least an Anglo-Saxonist and a Chaucerian. Uh, now we're lucky if there's a single medievalist, they're almost usually, almost always a late medievalist, they very well often may be medieval plus Shakespeare, and uh, not all of them are philologists. And that, 20 years is an eye blink in academic time, and that's uh, what happens. And even those philologists are, are not as good as the ones in previous generations. Now that's probably likely to be a more controversial statement, um, and, and I apologize if I've uh, offended the philologists in the audience by saying, I said philologists with a plural. Sometimes I crack myself up. But um, <laughs> actually, I don't think even any philologists here would object too strenuously to my contention. We're just not as good on average and across the profession as our own teachers. And we're certainly not as good as the scholars two and three generations ago. Um, we hide the decline with the combination of the completion of those great reference works and the, the power of information technology. And uh, after I was wrote this paper, I thought of this the other night. Maybe that's not entirely bad. Uh, my father's a physician, and he was telling me that, you know, when he first came into the profession, you had to learn, he's a cardiologist, you had to learn everything by listening. And there were guys who could diagnose everything by listening, just listening with a stethoscope. And then uh, he was one of the pioneers of uh, echocardiology. Cardio so, and echocardiograms were originally used, he had these things were all over our house, these giant purplish brown printouts and with squiggles on them that made no sense, but he could read them. Just last year in his office, he got some giant new expensive ultrasound machine that you can just look at the person's heart inside. And they diagnosed a heart defect that is statistically one in 1.3 million and is never found and the machine picked it up like that. So on the one hand, the new people coming up can't listen. They're not good at that. On the other hand, they don't have to because they have machines that do it better. Yeah, trade-off, I'd rather someone could do both, um, is, is what I would uh, prefer. So, uh, but how do I really know that there's this decline in philology? Um, because I am just good enough to be able to understand what philological greatness is, but not good enough on a, to accomplish it on my own and unaided. Um, so I can understand and even explain how in Ankrenen Wissa and Hadi Maithad, Tolkien somehow recognized that a particular class of verbs had one extra letter in the spellings of their endings. And that this phenomenon demonstrated that they were pronounced in a certain way that showed that Anglo-Saxon had, con had continued to be spoken well through the Norman conquest, past the conquest, because the language had time to undergo sound changes that could only be detected in these spellings of certain class verbs. And from that, he reconstructed the linguistic history of the West Midlands in England. I can understand how that works, but I cannot do it. And that's, the, I think, the difference. Uh, I have an excuse. My training in, uh, was deficient because I had to waste a lot of time learning things like literary theory so that I could get a job. 
which was important, I will admit. Uh, I'm therefore not as well educated as someone who got a PhD 24 years before me, and that person in turn was not as well educated as the person who got a PhD 20 years before them. Thanks, literary theory. I use it so often, too. Um, but let me give an example of all of this by doing some philology right here in front of you, um, and so that you can see what I mean. And uh, of course, I'm going to start with the opening of Beowulf. So, uh, what? We got a dame in your dogum, feod kuninga, thrim ya frunan, who thought Athegas, Ellen Fremadon. Oft shield chafing, shiavana triatum, monigum, maithum, medo settler, oft hair, eos or the erla sit an erest wear, feas shaft funden, it as fro freya bear, whelks under walknum, wearth mundum tha, o that him I which dar um setendra over fron rada, who run shoulder. Gomban Guldan thought was God kidding. And so here's. <laughs> um, by the way, you probably noticed that Tolkien used to start his Beowulf lectures by doing that, by throwing open the door at the back of the lecture hall and walking in, declaiming Beowulf. But he would do the first, uh, the first 52 lines. I just did the first 11. Now, and my theory then was that he did that to uh, scare students out of his classes, <laughs> so that he had fewer papers to grade if he read the Lord of the Rings. But that's a, that's one of the things. Philology tells you this isn't true or historical, because how many people came to lectures had nothing to do with how many papers he graded. So, um, not true. Uh, not true at all. I wish it was, but um, I tried. Uh, so, let me give you my, my absolutely as literal as I can do a possible modern English translation of that passage. Yo! <laughs> we have heard of the glory of the Spear Danes in the Elder Days, how those kings of the people accomplished valorous deeds. Often, shield chafing took away the mead benches from hordes of enemies from many nations. He terrified the earls after he had first been found with few possessions. He was repaid for that. He grew great under the skies, prospered in worth, until every one of those surrounding him across the seas had to listen to him and to pay tribute. That was a good king. I want to focus on line 6a, which in the Old English I read as Eosoda Erlas, and I translated as terrified the earls. However, in the manuscript of Beowulf, uh, Cotton Vitellius A15 at the British Library, uh, it's on public display. So if you go to the Treasures of the British Library exhibit, Beowulf is open, and they turn a different page open every day. And I wanted to spend several days so I could see more pages, but um, <laughs> I had a chance to hold it, and I blew it by telling the truth to someone when I should have just kept up with my lie <laughs> about why I needed it, but I'll tell that story some other time. Um, so the manuscript says, Eo sede, Eo sede Earl, Eo, uh, instead of what I read you was Eo sede Erlos. And so the, the literal translation for the manuscript would be, often shield chafing took away the mead benches from hordes of enemies from many nations, terrified the Earl. Now. The Earl, singular, just one. Now maybe there's some like really famous badass Earl that we don't know about. Um, but terrified the Earl is very weird in a passage that talks about dominating entire nations. I mean, it's kind of like we said, well, you know, Napoleon, he conquered Germany and half of Russia and Italy, and, and then he really scared the heck out of this one nobleman in Belgium, you know. I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work. So scholars amend that form to Eor Las, which is a slightly better improvement. It's like he terrified the earls with a general sense that uh, the interpretation is he terrified like earl, all earls everywhere. Uh, you know, anyone who might have to fight him. It doesn't work. Uh, I mean, it, it, it does work, but it also relies on uh, accepting that the scribe made a pretty huge blunder in line six. You know, like right away from the beginning, the scribe's like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> and, um, and once you start to think about what's going on here, even earls in the plural doesn't necessarily work because the, the people who are terrified by Schild's violent interior decorating, um, you know, removing meat benches, uh, are not just earls, but they're whole peoples, and they're the kings at the higher level of the nobility as well. I mean, if earls means generally fighting men, but that's not usually what it means in Anglo-Saxon. It means like a noble group, but that doesn't include every uh, warrior. So. Um, just dropping terrified the earls in there and assuming the scribe made an error seems a little awkward. And so this is where we uh, work like a philologist. Let's look at the word earl in this uh, context a little more closely. Uh, 
Way back in 1924, there was a, someone named Suell uh, wrote a tiny little note in the Times Literary Supplement, and he proposed that this word might be a reference not to any generic earl or earls, but to a specific Germanic tribe, the Heruli. Ah, you say, now it makes sense, the Heruli, of course. <laughs> uh, I'll get back to that, but let's do the philology for a second. Um, the reconstruction would go something like this. The Anglo-Saxon spelling of the word Heruli would be something like E-O-R-L-E, -E, Aorla. Uh, so let's say that the Beowulf poet put Aorla in that spot in the poem. Back when the poem was written, everybody knew about the Heruli, but when the poem was copied in the 10th century, the scribe had no idea who these people were. He sees Aorla in the manuscript, he thinks it's a dative singular, and he thinks, boy, that poet really didn't know his grammar. Uh, that needs to be accusative singular. So it, it's the direct object of the verb that comes right before it. So I know I'm going to just write Earl, E-O-R-L, e because that's the accusative singular. So he just took a dative singular, changed it to accusative singular, even though that makes it terrified the, the X. And why is he doing that? Because he's reading kind of half line by half line, not going back and rereading the whole sentence. Um, but there are some potential problems with that interpretation. The editors of Kleber's Beowulf say, Eorle would not be the proper plural form of the name, since such I stem plurals of national names ought to show front mutation, the exception seaxa being due to analogy to weak seaxon, CSB section 261, which is a cite to the third German edition from 1965 of Edward Siever's Anglo-Saxon grammar. So, Here's the thing. The editors of Kleber IV seem to understand what they're saying there. Uh, Sievers and the old school philologists understood what they're saying. Tom Shippey understands what they're saying. Rick Russom understands what they're saying. And I do not. And I have tried. I have tried a lot for a long time on this. And the problem is that I can't for sure tell what's deep philology from special pleading for this particular case. Um, the editors of Kleber's Beowulf are saying that Eor is an I stem noun. And simply that means that in its Proto Germanic form, uh, the word had a, a, the letter I, which is pronounced like we would pronounce double E. So it's pronounced E in the stem syllable. So it'd be like E, E or le, or something like that. Then a process of front mutation occurs. And this just means that if you have a long I, the E sound, somewhere in a word, the syllable before that long I that vowel gets raised. So if you have a, ah, it becomes e. Eh. If you have a, uh, it becomes a. Ah. If you have e, eh, it becomes it. The vowel moves up in your mouth. That's what front mutation is. And like all philological learning is basically learning eye mutation places and figuring out when it happened and how many times it happened and why it stopped happening and what happened when the other syllable got um, removed. Like the Germans love eye mutation and they call it eye umlaut. Uh, so the uh, but here's the, here's the problem. Aorl doesn't look like an I stem to me. In, in fact, at least one old English grammar book classifies it as an A stem, which does different things. Uh, and in fact, the plurals and so forth are the A stem plurals, even in the I stem words, except for in a few cases. Um, also, that very same old English grammar, Bright's old English grammar, if you care, uh, says that among the I declension nouns, Proper names like Dene and Angle are the only ones that keep E as their plural forms in the nominative and accusative. So what that means is national names like the Danes and the Angles get an E on the end. Dene, Angle, which is just a plural, and it's like saying the Swedes or the Danes or the Russians, right? We put a plural on there to mean the collective uh, group. So it seems to me that by analogy, if you have a people named the Eor, it automatically goes into the plural, the Eorle, and that I mutation wouldn't apply. But here's the real problem. A real philologist, a philologist of Tolkien's generation, would be able to do this off the top of his or her head. Well, I've spent like six months of combined time over four years rooting through books, not being sure that I'm following the argument properly, much less whether I'm right or not. In fact, my gut level feeling is that the original form wasn't a e o r l e, but e r l e, uh, erle without the diphthong, because to my ear the line works better metrically that way instead of eo so that eorlas. Right, that's a lot of syllables for an Anglo-Saxon line, which is basically a four-stress line. I would take it as eo so that erle, 
a so that er la instead of a or la with the with the, the two sounds. Um, and so my guess is the scribe saw e r l e assumed not that it was a grammatical error, but that it was just a typo, or we call it a manuo, right? A copying <laughs> error, sounded it out, and took the sense of the half line, basically, oh, no, no, we spell Earl this way now, uh, without thinking of the meaning of the whole sentence. And note that in lines 18 and 53 of Beowulf, the scribe calls a character who's the son of Schild Schaefing, he calls him Beowulf, even though every scholar looks at the poem that thinks this should be Beo. Uh, because the, the genealogies have Beo as the son of Schild, and uh, the metrics doesn't work with Beowulf, but it works with Beo, and um, it, it just it seems awkward with Beowulf. And also, when uh, Beowulf, the hero, shows up, no one says, wow, you have the same name as my grandfather. <laughs> Never mentioned, so, even though we've said the grandfather's name a couple times. So it seems to me, and, and many other people, that the scribe copying the poem sees B-E-O-W in the manuscripts, and he thinks it's an abbreviation for Beowulf, since he knows he's copying a poem about Beowulf, and he expands it there. And by the way, Tolkien thought that too. So, um, so it must be great. <laughs> so, um, and I think that especially at the beginning of the poem, the A scribe of Beowulf, thought he should be fixing a lot of stuff. And so he did it with a pretty heavy hand until he realized he just didn't understand very much. I mean, that's how Amor's name gets turned into Yaelmor, which means mournful. Um, there's a character named Amor in Beowulf, and yeah, it's just it's mournful. It makes very little sense because the scribe did not know who the heck Amor was and didn't take it as a proper name. He even spells Cain wrong. Twice. It's four letters, right? You know? um, but this is the problem with being the lesser son of a great sire. Uh, I don't know enough to make the argument effectively. I've never published on this topic. And the thing is, I've asked many scholars of my own generation, and not one of them has ever said, no, Drought, you're making an obvious mistake. Duh, I mutation applies in this and this and this case. Or, wow, Drought, that's awesome. You're absolutely right, and here's why. They don't know. There's been a decline. So for the sake of argument, let's say I'm right. And I just did that because I never get to do that in my personal life. <laughs> I've tried. Like, for the sake of argument, say I'm right. No, 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 we're not going to do that. Um, but even if I am right, who cares, right? Isn't that always the problem with philology? You philologists are all hung up on a couple of letters, and you're ignoring what people really care about in Beowulf. Monsters, heroes, post-colonialism. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Nobody actually cares about post-colonialism in medieval studies. We just pretend to do so in order to get jobs. Um, but here's why you should care about line six of Beowulf. It actually might have something to do with post-colonialism. Um, the Heruli were a barbarian Germanic tribe who lived in Europe in the third through the fifth centuries. You may not have heard of them, um, but they attacked Byzantium. They sacked Athens. And oh yeah, with the help of the Ostrogoths, they defeated the Roman emperor in 476. So, yeah, the Beowulf poet might say, those Heruli. They were allies with the Goths, they were beaten by the Huns, and they eventually migrated to Scandinavia, where they were the neighbors of the Geats, Beowulf's people, and they eventually were expelled and either murdered or assimilated until there was no remaining trace of them by the Danes. Yes, according to Jordanus, an important early historian who unfortunately wasn't always about just making stuff up, um, it was the Danes who finally put an end to the Heruli by expelling them from their home in southern Scandinavia, the southern part of contemporary Sweden. That's interesting, because in line 19b of Beowulf, we find out that Schild Schaefing's son Beo, who's also a Dane, ruled Shedelandum in, which can be translated as in southern Scandinavia. Is this a coincidence? You really think it's a coincidence? Wake up, America! <laughs> I always wanted to do that. Uh, I stole that from one of my students, I have to say. She did an April Fool's prank in um, the Anglo-Saxon class. She was supposed to do a, a talk on Beowulf and paleography. And so she did a talk on Beowulf and paleontology, in which she said that Grendel was a small T-Rex, and uh, the dragon was a pterodactyl, and she pulled this out with like a straight face for quite a while. She had some, you know, kind of creationist websites that said things about this. And then, and then she finally gets to, dragons have wings, pterodactyls have wings, wake up America! <laughs> So I just I needed to steal that. Thanks, Audrey. If you're, uh, so if line 6a is about the Heruli, 
and not about generic girls, then the poet is listing Schild Schaffing, Schaffing's resume. He's subjugated a lot of neighboring tribes. He took away their meat benches, which is a metaphor for eliminating their political power and putting them under his rule. And he terrified, which I think is a laitotes, uh, I think he means committed genocide, uh, against the Heruli. That tribe that was once so badass that they defeated the emperor of Rome. I mean, they helped. I mean, I'm probably they, they sure they would have. And just the news of them signing up for the sacking was a big deal. And anyway, they sacked Byzantium and Athens. And isn't that enough anyway for them to be cool? You know, like, like we could do that. But, and then after Shil terrified the Heruli, his son Beowulf ruled in southern Scandinavia, where the Heruli had been. And I think all of this changes how we read the poem of Beowulf. All that good, normal English department stuff flows out of how we read this word. Because instead of it being a generic proem at the beginning of the poem, as it's usually called, oh, Schild, he was so great. He defeated you know, lots of enemies, doesn't matter which ones. And he ruled in some place, like in a galaxy far, far away. Um, instead of that generic proem, we get a very specific opening that says, this great king, known as Schild Schaefing, led the Danes in conquering large parts of southern Scandinavia. His son, Beo, ruled well and passed the kingdom on to his son, Hafta and in turn passed it on to his son Hrothgar, who expanded the Danes' territory and built a huge mead hall called Herod. And setting aside that this actually is starting to turn out to be archaeologically and historically true with the excavations at Lyra uh, in Denmark that show the largest Germanic hall in all of Europe, and what does the Babel poet say about Herod? A giant hall bigger than one the children of men had ever seen before. Um, setting aside that, which is like, should probably be the whole center of the talk, um, <laughs> we can also note that the poem is all of a sudden given a really specific setting that the audience can have knowledge of. It's not fairyland or far, far away. Instead, it's, I don't know, something like the fallen kingdom of Arnor in the northwest of Middle Earth, part of what Tolkien called the named lands of the north. If we read the poem this way, we see the poem as being set into history. And whether it's invented or legendary history doesn't really matter at this point. It's still in some kind of history that the audience shared the knowledge of. The poem is a lot more sophisticated, and it's a lot more interesting than it being about some dude who fights monsters once upon a long time ago and far, far away. Uh, it's instead about a dude who fights monsters in the year 520 on the island of Zealand in Denmark and in southern Sweden. And that makes a very big deal in the kind of poem that Beowulf is. But here's the problem. I can't be sure that my contention is true in philological terms. And more to the point, and this is actually the real thing. This is not supposed to be like an extended humility topos for drought. Oh, I'm such a bad philologist. Feel sorry for me. Um, instead, it's, this is the, the, the real heart of the problem. The field as a whole, the discipline as a whole, cannot evaluate the truth of the argument in its own terms. We can follow a chain of logical reasoning if someone writes one, which is uh, surprisingly a lot rarer than you'd think in academia. Um, but as an intellectual discipline, as a community of scholars, we can't evaluate many of the unstated premises that go along with that kind of reasoning. We don't know enough about the background of philology that was shared by all the people who wrote the big books. We look in the book, we find the answer, found the answer in the book. But the answer was put in the book by people some of whom disagreed with each other, and we don't have that background knowledge there. Um, I, I said in print a couple years ago that the giant fight uh, over the date of Beowulf was an example of scholars manufacturing consensus by giving the people what they wanted. What they wanted was a Beowulf that was not tied down to the 8th century. But interestingly, the specific people who engineered the dating controversy, they just wanted to move Beowulf into the Viking Age because they were experts on that period. They didn't anticipate that we'd end up with a supposedly undateable Beowulf that was composed everywhere and nowhere. I mean, and if you, if you go down the final path of madness, at least I take it to be that, of like the Jeffrey Jerome Cohen group, whose a Beowulf really was written now, was really written everywhere and by everyone. And I'm like, yeah, I guess you could say that. Because <laughs> you could say a lot of things. Um, but what they got, what these people who kind of broke up the consensus got, was uh, in part because the lit people don't like being restricted in their interpretations. But even in greater part because people were more than happy to take some eminent scholars at their word that philology just must be wrong. Because that meant they didn't have to go through the long slog of learning philology themselves. So there was this feedback loop 
between the general decay in philological learning, the desire to avoid being a subject of Dame philology's strict discipline, and the anything goes mentality of postmodern approaches to many things, uh, which allow you to say whatever the heck you, you want, because postmodern style means you never have to define your terms. So what you end up with, as Shippey describes, is Beowulf being attached to uh, his quote, the developing enthusiasms of the academy, one after another. Beowulf and chaos theory, Beowulf and women's studies and gender theory, Beowulf and critical theory, Beowulf and queer theory, Beowulf and post-colonialism. Each of these developments was at the time her heralded as the next big thing that was going to bring glory, recognition, students, and most importantly money uh, to medieval studies. And they all failed, as did the goofy new philology of the 1990s and uh, its current embodiment in manuscript-focused studies. Uh, because both developments of those things are a bunch of privileged scholars saying, you must work directly on the manuscripts, and um, if your institution doesn't own any, or you don't have a giant travel allowance to spend a lot of time in libraries and expensive capital cities in Europe, and, or you have a family and don't want to uh, be away from them in the summer in a dusty library, well, then you're just a gigantic loser and should know your place, peasant. <laughs> Okay, that's maybe a little exaggeration, but one scholar who's big on this is a professor at Stanford University with a $70,000 research budget every year. I don't want to hear about that. I need to go look at the manuscript. Um, my overall point, I think, stands. All efforts to adapt medieval studies by linking them uh, to trendy schools of criticism have done exactly zero to expand the popularity of the field. The only thing that has expanded the popularity of the field is J.R.R. Tolkien and fantasy literature. Uh, and that's the one thing that all those schools can, can tend to reject, uh, though some of that is starting to, to change a little bit. Uh, now, working in one of the schools can help a given scholar get or keep a job, but it doesn't do anything for the field as a whole, which is continuing to wither away. Uh, Shippey calls it the curse of philology, which he said was cast upon critical studies with the dying breaths of Dame philology to win the battle against philology and language study, but lose the war exactly because philology was the real source of power for literary studies. And uh, I was up to this point trying to resist going all Tolkien referency, but I can't take it anymore. Um, <laughs> so here it goes. Uh, it's pretty easy for someone like me to revel in the current pain of critical studies, to gleefully recite the dreadful statistics for jobs and employment, um, and to gloat while saying, um, all you said you cared about was popularity and being the academic cool kids, and now nobody actually likes you. And they like Tolkien and fantasy and myth and medieval literature, not critical theory, which everybody hates and talks about behind its back. Yan, yan, yan. Um, and I can't deny that I've done that a lot. But while I was actually writing this talk, it suddenly came, became clear to me that in celebrating the destruction of literary studies, as revenge for his betrayal of philology, I was sounding an awful lot like Saruman, who snaps, you have doomed yourselves and you know it, and it will, Ill, it will afford me some comfort as I wander to think that you pulled down your own house when you destroyed mine. Uh, by the way, I, I think that Tolkien missed an enormous opportunity at that moment in the, in the, the, the uh, plot when Saruman is talking to Gandalf and Galadriel and Elrond, and Tolkien could have had Saruman then say, and as for you, Elrond, your mother was a seagull and your father lives in a flying boat. <laughs> I don't even know why that's an insult. <laughs> but in, in any event, the analogy between my arguments and Saruman's words isn't perfect. Um, in fact, it's even a bit of a stretch since Elrond, Galadriel, and so forth pulled down their own house uh, not just for personal ambition, but because they wanted to save the world from domination by evil. Um, but still, I don't want to be Saruman. I'd rather be Arendelle, because I would get to be married to a seagull and live in a flying boat. But, um, <laughs> but uh, because I will here then, in the end of this talk, I will try to be a messenger, bringing the news of how literary studies could maybe lift the curse of philology, and how philology could recover some of its former power. What literary studies need to do to escape the curse is simple and straightforward. Restore Dame Philology to her rightful place of honor. That's all. There's not even any need to give up what Harold Bloom called the six schools of resentment, or the tendency to read absolutely everything politically. You can still do that. All that must be done is to recognize that the scientific study of language belongs at the heart of the discipline, and that scholars and students need to know how language works. And that would fit under the definition of linguistics, discipline of linguistics, and how language has changed over time, 
as represented in texts, particularly literary ones, and that is philology. The benefits from recovering philology will be enormous for every subfield because the discipline can replace seat of the pants guessing, and well, it seems that way to me, with rigorous reasoning grounded in cognitive science and in history. If you really believe the value of feminist approaches, or of queer theory, or of focus on sexuality, or even post-colonialism, if you really believe those, if you believe that they tell you important things about the world, then adding philological insights just makes them stronger rather than undercutting them. It makes them more explanatory. It makes them more able to accomplish the goals that you want them to accomplish in changing the world. And as a side benefit, by restoring philology, you also get her sister, tradition, and their handmaiden, literary history, back into the center of the curriculum. What's in this for philology? And the philologists, you might ask. Well, survival, <laughs> persistence, return to long lost glory, but something I think even more important, improvement. The intellectual edifice of philology is a great human accomplishment, but it's not perfect. Like all human creations, it's riddled with errors, which have many causes. Bad assumptions, bits of confused thinking, guesses taken as facts, overconfidence in individual scholars, faulty data. Philology's long slow motion defeat has actually done us a service of shaking the tower so that all the loose bricks fell out and all the poorly constructed walls fell down. And now, knowing the flaws, we can rebuild them stronger. Maybe if this time, if we're fortified with ideas outside of philology and recognition of things like politics and gender relations and sexuality and the post-colonial paradigm, maybe we can build these walls more plumb, more true, and more strong. So, how do we get to that point? How do we get to the point that Tolkien tried to create in his valedictory address, where Lit and Lang would finally work together to lift the curse of Lady Philology? Well, it's going to require some luck, and it probably will require that literary suffer studies suffer some more pain, uh, and that there will be collateral damage in philology during this period of destruction. But I think the return of philology is inevitable because the discipline at its best is right, it's true, and it's also powerful and useful. So I said I'd like to be Arendelle, but I will very much settle for being Theoden. And so I don't get delusions of grandeur. Let's say Theoden before the ride of the railroad, before he became the greatest. Um, uh, I want to be the Theoden who says to Saruman, a lesser son of great sires am I, but I do not need to lick your fingers. Theoden is not just being modest. He realizes, in a way that I only realize in the process of writing this talk, that not only is there nothing wrong with being a lesser son of great sires, it's a point of pride. Such a statement means that the kings of the house of Aora were great, and so were the lords of philology, and I am proud to be part of their tradition. Like Theoden, I don't expect to win in my lifetime, but also like Theoden, I have hope. I have hope because not only is philology true and powerful and useful, but it's beautiful in its abstract simplicity and its complicated details. And I have hope because new developments in information technology like the Lexomics Research Group our, uh, research our group is doing with computer-assisted statistical analysis will just make philology even more powerful. But I have even more hope for one important reason that I'm seeing right now, is I can look around this room and I see it full, the big audience that Raquel didn't think I would have, <laughs> filled with people who are willing to sit through a talk on Germanic philology, who are willing to devote time, energy, intellect, and scarce resources to studying the workings of language, myth, and literature. We are Lady Philology's hearth companions, and we need only keep the discipline alive. For though the fruit of the tree comes seldom to ripeness, Yet the life within may then lie sleeping through many long years, and none can foretell the time in which it will awake. None can foretell, but that's okay. I don't need to foretell, because I can look around this room and see. Thank you.
That went a little longer because I improvised, but um, we got five minutes for questions, right? So, so are there any questions or anyone who wants to tell me throughout? That's a terrible idea about the Agasota uh, Airlet. Tim. Uh, you know, I, I took one of our courses on philology, and we were, you know, I, I couldn't digest it all. It was just too intense. But I kept asking myself, how do they know? Okay? And I think that's the biggest problem. I'm, I'm not questioning the rules. I'm not questioning the laws they found. But what it, I think is needed is somebody to bridge the gap between our the, their credibility and the fact that they are sound and scientific and they are actual factual. That that's what I would, would kind of think that, is, that, that is, is really missing. That is exactly it. That's why I say that there's not good textbooks. There's not good explanation of how we know this stuff because so much of it was developed because they knew so many languages and so that they could just recognize the patterns between the languages and when you knew all those languages when it was you know latin and greek and german and french and italian and you know lombardic and anglo-saxon and, and gothic and so forth you had that that um source material and then it became you know intuitively obvious to you but the, the how we know is a lot of, uh, I think that what you're reacting to is it's a lot of inference and it's a lot of kind of network knowledge that, okay, we're not sure about this thing, but if this thing is true, then this thing must be true. And there's this other piece over that we do know that, you know, once we link those up and, um, you know, a lot of it, sometimes it seems like when you get something like Grimm's Law, and you can line up the sounds, and then you learn about how we make the sounds in the mouth, and like, oh, really? So I just move my tongue one slot back? You're right, that all, that all works, and then that makes sense. But for a, a lot of it, that, that's a real weakness. Uh, I mean, you kind of have, have hope with that if, if Signum has uh, you know, a philology course, that it's going to have a philology textbook, and it's going to build those things in. I'm trying to write a textbook this summer for a course I did called Evolution of English, that instead of starting like, here's English and then there were many sound changes, that starts with like the development of writing systems and how we figured out how to put scratches on a piece of paper or clay to get words to pop into people's heads. But it's, it's really, it's amazing that the, what you just said is exactly the problem, is that we have a very tough time explaining how we know this stuff. And, um, and like physics doesn't have that problem, right? And that's, that's the, the weakness. But it, for those of us who've worked in it a long time, we just have sort of internalized all these assumptions. And so what we end up relying on is, that's what the dictionary says. You know, that, that's what uh, Denison and Hogg say in their book, so it must be true. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't be there, right? That's, that's what happens when you have a field that has so much consensus for a long time that nobody feels they have to explain anything. I mean, the Germans are the worst about this. I have read a footnote, my, one of my most admired colleagues, Mechthild Gresh, wrote this, this footnote about how stupid somebody else's argument was and how bad their answer, and never gave what the actual right answer was. <laughs> because of course everybody knows. And so, and that's, and you know what, that's bad. That's like, I don't, I don't buy at all that that's just, you know, how you do things to show that you really know. No, if you can't explain it all the way through, you don't know it and you don't understand it. And that's one of the things that is a weakness in philology. But Tom puts that as to bad teaching, but I also put it down as to, you know, the kind of arrogance and exclusivity that you get when you're in a position of enormous privilege. When you, you know, have, you know for sure your students are gonna get jobs and that you'll be at, you know, Oxford University forever and you don't have to try to explain anything to the public. And again, what's, the, what's great about how the, the weird history that has, you know, went to Tolkien's immense popularity bringing back this kind of study is that it get, I hope it gets regrounded in the idea that you need to be able to explain it in its details and not just go, everybody knows that, because they don't. And it's really obvious now, and it maybe wasn't in the time of Grimm. Um, sorry, that's a really long answer. <laughs> Uh, Professor Dry, I really enjoy when you do the uh, the philology of a name like Theodoric. I know you did one on, on Attila too, which was which is magnificent. So I, the, the theme of this conference is evoking wonder. So let me ask a question that's sort of consistent with that. When you do the phyl philology of names, I mean, you know, I, I guess the question is, how far back can you can you go, and what do you expect to find? I mean, what answers do you expect to find? You know, as you go farther and farther back with, with you know names, phrases, words, that sort of thing. So this reminds the conversation I had with someone last night where I used the, the line that uh, stole Shippy's line that no language uh, 
changed as rapidly in the 1880s as Proto-Indo-European. Um, <laughs> because that's, that's usually where we get stuck, right? Is that Proto-Indo-European one, it was, it was spoken about 50,000 years ago and nobody had writing. There's no, so the data is all reconstructive and it's a lot of guessing and it's a lot of, you know, running laws backwards uh, to find things. So usually where you stall out is around, um, for names and things, is you usually stall around around the migration period. Um, maybe into the, the, the Roman period and when you're really lucky back into the biblical uh, texts there. And there's really great philology that's done on biblical names, for example. And I, I, who was I talking to that showed me that like some of the names of the characters in the, the uh, early books of the Bible actually have the word Baal in them, in the name of the good guys. Too, which shows you some stuff behind it. So, like, like Tolkien, like Shippy, I just love names, and I love how names change and how they mean, and when they're puns, and when, like, you know, when the, like my my wife's name is Raquel, so like you're just a sheep, you know. Um, <laughs> Rachel means sheep, and she's into knitting, so it all works. You know? <laughs> um, and I just I love that kind of stuff, and I, I love watching the the process of when a name when something gets fossilized and gets passed on, and so nobody even knows, or even they don't look in the background. So, you know, after the popularity of um, The Lord of the Rings, some people named their children Samwise, um, which for the character is great, but means half-witted, um, literally. Or, you know, we have names like Edward and like, really, you're guardian of prosperity in there. What? Or my student Audrey, who I just called Athelthrith all the time, because that's what the name was originally. So I would say that you take names back as, as far as you can, and onomastics, is uh, it's one of the places that people will just, they, they love it. Like when I do an icebreaker with my students, I tell them what their last names mean. I, I take time to look it up in Ekval, uh, the big reference book of it, and figure out what their last names might mean. And um, this is like the ultimate icebreaker because people are thrilled about it. And what I'm starting to finally get to learn is what names in um, Asian languages and uh, you know non uh, Eastern, non-Western European traditions mean, and it turns out it's so many of the same things, right? It's like there are occupation names, and there's place names, and there's social rank names, and there's the references to mythology names, and so, again, a, a long answer for that. I think you you trace back till the records run out, and um, unfortunately, you know, for the for the Germanic world, those written records are you're pretty much going back to whatever some Germans said about. I mean, some Romans said about the Germans. Uh, but even then, you can, if you read it carefully and closely, you can sometimes figure out patterns like where Tolkien was, comes out, pretty much figures out that Herod was a cult site um, to Frere, and then the archaeology from the 2000s shows that he's right. And it's just like, how did you do that? And the answer was, you read closely with this, this background knowledge. It sounds easy, it's not, but it's, uh, it's fun. There was, I think, one more? Do you see the technology helping to bridge the gap that Tim was talking about? Is being able to help in some way bridge that? It could. The problem is that, that a lot of the technology becomes black box. And then you're like, well, Lex Omics, oh, you know, I mean, I, I had to, I worked with one of my honor students and she kept saying, well, Lexo says. I'm like, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't actually say, it just printed out a graph. You, you said it. Um, and that's, that's the, the challenge of the technology, right, is to, to open that black box a little bit, to figure out what it's doing. And it makes it in some ways hard. You get more capabilities. It's like, you know, I can run a person through the ultrasound machine and see their heart valve defect. But, um, I also need to have kind of a deep understanding of what the thing is. Like, so I don't need to know how the ultrasound machine processes the image, except to the degree that I need to know how it might get it wrong. Um, but I do need to know a lot about the heart. And that's the technology, I hope, leads us into knowing more about the text and the story and the way. And the same thing with, you know, I think that the, the, one of the big fut futures of literary studies is cognitive science. Is, Everyone has always known you needed some kind of psychology to understand literature. Unfortunately, they picked Freud. Um, you know, I mean, we might as well look at chicken entrails or something. Um, but there's there's real and better psychology being done now, and you can. You know, one one of my students wrote a great piece on uh, it was on a science fiction novel on three body problem, but one of the, as one of the characters is having a post traumatic stress. 
disorder, but she didn't go to Freud and say that it was you know because your dad was mean to you or something. She went to real psychological research on PTSD survivors and matched it up with the author's portrayal. And so th that's what I think is where literary studies should go is not to like be taken over by science and taken over by technology and taken over by these things, but to integrate it. In, and that then puts the literary mythological people kind of where they belong, which is trying to synthesize about what it is, what a human reads and, and feels these things. So I think the technology can help that. I think we have to kind of be very, um, always remember that it, it's easy to say the computer gave me the answer and we want to we want to resist that a little bit. And and then what Tim says, but it's, the computer gave me the exam answer is the same thing as the OED gave me the answer. Um, if you can't follow the reasoning, then you don't really know the answer yet. Uh, kind of building off of that, um, I know that in the valedictorian address, Tolkien makes a distinction between lit and lang, and he says, no, you've got to have both of them together. And I think that sometimes it is also easy for us to fall into the temptation of doing lang without the lang. Like, as in, oh, I'm going to go read some stuff about Old Norse instead of reading Old Norse. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that is why I'm so excited about what Signet is doing. Um, because, I mean, there's, there's nobody else who's going to be like, yeah, I'll teach you Old Norse on Tuesday nights. You know? <laughs> <laughs> nobody else is doing that. Um, but I, so just to kind of echo off of what you just said, it is, there's no substitute for just like sitting down doing the work, like sit down with the grammar, and, and uh, you know, one of the things that I, I did a presentation on in my Intro to Old Norse class this last semester was why there are so many verbs in Old Norse that take the date of the case. Like, there's there's a heck of a lot of them, and it's really weird, and there's more than there should be. So, trying to figure out, asking the question, well, why is it that way, and then going and, and starting to work into it. Um, but I would never have noticed that if I had just read about Old Norse or read some Old Norse things in translation, um, or read a Wikipedia summary of the vowel changes in Old Norse. You've all done it too. <laughs> uh, I know exactly which uh, <laughs> which Wikipedia yeah. are that you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> but I would never have noticed that if I hadn't just sat down with an Old Norse grammar and said, "All right, Richard, you're, you're eight years old again. You're starting over. How does the language?" I, I agree, and I, I know I don't want. I'm not going to be the one who makes us be late all day either. So uh, I'll just gonna, the, the thing I'll end with is that one of the things that Corey and I have been talking about, and uh, also with Chris Pearson from uh, Turbine and, and Lord of the Rings Online, is how can you gamify the learning of languages and philology and stuff like that? Because that's the next that's the next wave. If we can do that, if we can make it fun to learn paradigms and, and learn, then you can increase that knowledge everywhere, and out of that knowledge and community can come synthesis and knowledge. Okay, I'm going to stop because we have papers to go to also, but I just want to thank everyone. There's just such a great audience.